Welcome to the U.S. Conference. Hello and welcome to the U.S. Conference of Mayors and Verizon Roundtable Series. I'm Andy Serwer, editor in chief of Yahoo Finance, a division of Verizon Media. We're hosting weekly roundtable discussions throughout the month of October, featuring key mayors and CEOs engaged in dialogue on some of the biggest challenges facing American cities today. The series is called A National Discussion on Achieving an American Breakthrough. This week's topic is dismantling racism. Let me now bring in Hans Vestberg, Chairman and CEO of Verizon for opening remarks. Hans, over to you. Thank you, Andy, and uh, thank you to all for joining this second week of, of this series of American uh, Breakthroughs. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank, thank my co-host from the uh, from the U.S. Mayors Conference uh, and uh, for doing this together with us. And uh, today we have a, uh, yet another great group of, uh, of leaders that will discuss the uh, dismantling racism. And we have uh, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms of Atlanta. We have Mayor Hardy Davis of Augusta, uh, Augusta, and he will join us hopefully soon. We have Mayor Christopher Cabaldon of West Sacramento. We have Mark Morial, which is a former uh, mayor of New Orleans, but the current CEO of the National Urban League. And uh, finally, we have Mary Smith uh, Campbell, which is the president of uh, Spelman College. So we will have a great conversation uh, with these uh, uh, distinguished uh, leaders about uh, mm -hmm. dismantling racism. Let me say a couple of words where I come from. And, and uh, first of all, uh, my job has been uh, a lot to, uh, around listening. I'm a Swedish citizen. I was born and raised in Sweden. But uh, today, uh, I'm, of course, working in the US as the CEO and chairman of Horizon. As we discussed already last week when we talked about economic growth, this country is uh, facing and all these great mayors are facing multiple challenges. I mean, everything from the pandemic to an economic uh, crisis, as well uh, as the racial injustice. All of them are super difficult to deal with, but they're very important. In the case of Horizon, I mean, for us, uh, uh, diversity and inclusion is a, a core value of our company and has been that for a long time. We need to reflect our society. We need to see uh, that everyone has an equal chance. And the brand purpose we have, we cannot be committed to that if we don't bring everyone with us. That has been uh, enormously important for me and the whole leadership team that we have as a company. Um, since we had the George Floyd incident, uh, of course, we have intensified all our work in this area. And uh, I have been personally doing outreach to 15, 20, 25 of the leaders of, of, of different uh, social uh, civil societies uh, in order to listen. And I think what my conclusion is that, first of all, we have a huge responsibility as a private sector company. I mean, we are one of the largest companies in the U.S. We can impact in so many ways. So we have a huge responsibility. Uh, the second thing is what I've learned in the discussion is a couple of areas that we are focused on, which we think we can impact on. First of all, procurement for minority-owned businesses. That's so important. And we have such a big responsibility and such a large procurement, so we should do it. And I've told everyone I've discussed with, if you see uh, minority-owned businesses that you think can serve the purpose to be a great supplier to Verizon, we are happy to bring them in. And we were part of founding the one billion dollar round table for uh, many years ago, which is companies procuring for more than one billion dollar uh, from minority owned businesses. We will continue that and we have ramped it up, especially in this pandemic and economic mm -hmm. downturn. The other thing is financing, financing of minority owned businesses. And uh, here we have uh, uh, recently been participating and supporting the first bond that came out to support minority owned businesses that Bank of America issued just a week ago. And we have also worked with our own uh, uh, bond that we did for a green bond to support American uh, uh, minority owned businesses to lead that. So there's more to be done in the financing area because ultimately that is a critical area. We have also been very uh, participating a lot in the discussion with criminal justice reform over the years. This is nothing happening right now, and uh, which we think are so important in order to have an equitable society and everybody has an equal chance. Finally, as a, a, a more internal responsibility, of course, seeing that we have the carrier right, we have uh, they have the C-suite represented with diversity and inclusion, we have our board, uh, etc. 
we just re reached out and, and, uh, and gave out our diversity report on all levels of the company in all units. And we are not perfect. We have areas we need to improve. There are areas where we're really strong when it comes to diversity. I'm especially proud of the board where I have three of the uh, black leaders sitting in my board giving me good advice. Again, it's about listening for us and seeing that we do the right things and having the right thing around them. Finally, I think broadband access, the digital divide that we discussed last week is enormously important in this uh, injustice as well, to see that everybody has an equal chance. And to the, in today's environment, the pandemic and people need to work from home, meeting friends from home, uh, the, the broadband, the accessibility, the affordability becomes even more, more important. And finally, the, what we have discussed with many of these uh, leaders as well is the voting, that everybody should vote. And we have uh, uh, agreed uh, with our employees that they will have the day off to vote uh, uh, when the election comes up. And we think that's an important for our democracy here. So we are trying to do everything we can. But just to be clear, the bar has gone up dramatically when it comes to dismantling race, racism for every uh, every every constituency, including private companies, and uh, we need to do even more. We know that. And uh, one way is, of course, having this conversation today and learn even more what we can do as a corporation and in collaboration with all these mayors that is running all these cities across the country. So with those words, I would like to hand it over to, uh, to the CEO of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, uh, Tom Cochran. So please, Tom. Thank you, Hans, and thank you, Horizon, for bringing us together in this incredible webinar today, and also for supporting uh, Mayor Fisher's dreams and visions for the American breakthrough. Today, uh, we are <coughs> discussing dismantling racism. And today, uh, we have uh, three, three incredible issues before us, civil unrest, economic challenges, health challenges, and yes, even death. And we find that the race issue involves each one of those because of the disparities that we have in the minority population. I just wanted just to give you a very brief uh, check on the United States Conference of Mayors in our history. The United States Conference of Mayors formed in 1932 had been very much involved uh, on this whole question of civil rights and race relations in America. It was in June of 1963 that a young president, John F. Kennedy, flew to Hawaii and addressed the United States Conference of Mayors and unveiled a five-point plan on civil rights. It was a white businessman from Atlanta, Georgia, named Ivan Allen, the mayor, who came to Washington in 1964 and testified for public accommodations. And we formed a, 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 a coalition to in the background to help the great march in 1963 with Mr. Bayard Rustin. And so from there, from there we went to the Voting Rights Act that we supported, and now we bring it up to 2020, and we continue in this struggle. The United States Conference of Mayors very early on were very fortunate to have black mayors to arise and come and to lead us. And so today we are faced with a situation that we continue to have racial issues. But unfortunately, in the 60s, in the early days, there was less violence. And we saw the split there. Today, we are very concerned about racial issues. But today, of course, we are facing an election. And let me tell you, mayors are very concerned about violence around the elections. And we're having another webinar on that uh, later on th this uh, week. But let me say that whatever we have done in the past, I have found that is the business community coming together at the local level make things happen. And so that's why I'm so encouraged by this webinar today to have all of you on this uh, call, on this webinar, and especially uh, my friend from the National Urban League who represents all of us as we go forward. And so I look forward to discussing with you and others. And thank you so much, Hans, for making this happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. I appreciate those remarks. Um, I encourage all the mayors that have joined webinar to submit their questions. And you can do that on the right-hand side of your screen. Please note that only mayors can ask questions. Um, 
you on also on the bottom left hand side of the blue jeans platform you have some viewing options and today's event is also being live streamed on Verizon and the USCM's LinkedIn pages so please share this so without any further ado let's jump right into this conversation and I'd like to start with Mayor Morialer Mr. Mayor, maybe I should call you Mr. CEO now that you're the CEO of the National Urban League. And also, as everyone I think probably knows about Mark, a second generation mayor, which I always find just fascinating about your personal story and journey. Um, so many of these issues have been critical to your career and your life. But you said recently that black America faces three pandemics, COVID, economic distress, and issues relating to policing and criminal justice. And I'm curious as to your take on, on where things are right now, Mr. Mayor. It, it seems thank like you. this is a very different time. Yeah, thank you very much, Andy. And let me thank uh, Hans and uh, the Verizon team. They're a great partner of the National Urban League. Certainly Tom Cochran, uh, my longtime friend and, and mentor, uh, who, uh, who uh, serves as the, as the executive director of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, and I also want to just say thank you to all of the mayors. I've watched many of you in this pandemic, and I got I have to tell you, I've watched you all with pride, a great deal of pride, a great sense that you all have stepped up and provided leadership. You've stepped into the breach, you've stepped into the vacuum, you've stepped in when there was no help in sight, uh, in many instances, either from state governments or from the national government in some places. Uh, and you all have performed uh, admirably. And I know you, the, 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 the pressure of a crisis uh, such as this that affects your city, affects your people. And I also know the challenges that your budgets are facing now with the downturn in the economy and certainly the decrease in tax collections. We, to answer your question, Andy, are at a crossroads a very significant crossroads. Uh, November 3rd is pivotal to the direction that this nation will take going forward. And I think it's going to answer the question as to whether there's going to be an embrace uh, of the notion that the country has got to grapple, not push to the side, not push under the rug, not ignore, many of the long-standing racial justice issues that the nation faces. In today's world, a majority of the American people and large pluralities of white Americans believe strongly that uh, we must confront, uh, and they say it by their support for the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, they say it in how they think about race relations, has to confront this long-standing legacy of racial uh, exclusion, racial discrimination, racial inequity here in the United States. Uh, the mayors, I think, of America are empowered to be both advocates, change agents, and architects and implementers of solutions. And I think that leaders in the public and private sectors should see the mayors and municipal governments as, as a place where issues of housing, issues of education, issues of infrastructure inequity, uh, issues of health inequities can substantially be dealt with. Uh, and I think that that message has to come through loudly and clearly. I said over and over again uh, when Congress was passing COVID bills, do not give the money that's meant for the cities to the states, give it directly to the cities and they will do make a big difference with it. Don't create bureaucratic red tape, roadblocks and hoops that cities, even counties, school, school districts and transit authorities have to jump through to receive support. So we're at this moment, uh, a crossroads moment, an inflection moment. And let me tell you, some substantial things are occurring in the country. The Business Roundtable, uh, uh, Tom, uh, will release uh, in the next few weeks a broad plan that they've worked on 
to address racial inequity in the United States. I mean, this is the business roundtable. This is the nation's leading CEOs. Uh, that's certainly indeed the case. Number two, public opinion polls are demonstrating a renewed will, a renewed uh, resolve uh, by many to confront all of these issues that the country continues to face. Uh, and then thirdly, there's a new movement uh, in the country at the grassroots level. And yeah, uh, there have been those who've tried to exploit uh, 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 this movement to create friction and unnecessary violence, but the core of the movement, uh, the, the animating spirit of that movement of blacks and whites and Hispanics and Asians and Native Americans who've been in the streets, who were in the streets, is a plea and a cry and a demand uh, for a better America. So we're at a crossroads, uh, and I think uh, my encouragement uh, to, to the mayors of America is to be loud and to be strong and to be thoughtful and to be intelligent because mayors know how to do all of the above at the same time. The nation needs to hear you every single day, not only in your local community, but on the national stage saying, this is what the nation needs. This is how you address this. Uh, and, and I am gonna be standing with you alongside of you uh, in, in that effort, because I think it is so crucial, Tom, uh, to where we are today. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to turn to Mayor Bottoms and talk to you a little bit about um, some of those points that Mark just brought up. And obviously this has been a very public facing year for you in terms of what's taken place in Atlanta and, and COVID, et cetera. But I'd like to ask you specifically what you've been doing to address systematic racism in terms of the criminal justice system and maybe the police in the city of Atlanta. So first of all, thank you, Andy. Um, it's a pleasure to join all of you all in the very kind words from uh, from Mayor Morial, who really was one of our country's best mayors. And as he was chatting, I wrote down the note to call him. I've got some questions for him. So I think that really speaks to this network that we have created, especially through the US Conference of Mayors. Um, but this year has been like no year that I think any of us could have scripted or anticipated. And even as I think back in my campaign for mayor and all the issues that come up when you are seeking elected office, uh, pandemic was not one, one of them. Um, and then on top of the pandemic, then dealing with the issues, the social, uh, the social protests that we saw under the sum, over the summer. That being said, we had already begun some work in Atlanta, and I'm very grateful for that. I was elected in 2017, taken office in 2018. And one of my first pieces of legislation that I pushed through our city council was to eliminate cash bail bonds in the city of Atlanta. The reason that's important um, is because it was very unfairly penalizing poor people simply for being poor. So if somebody stopped with a busted taillight or, or throwing a, a bottle out of a, a, a car window littering, they might have a $200 fine. If you had the money in your pocket, you could pay, you could leave. If you didn't, you could stay in our jail for six months. Um, after I eliminated cash bail bonds, we then moved on to our city's relationship with ICE. We had a, roughly a $10 million contract we would receive $10 million a year to house ICE detainees. After we ended that relationship with ICE during the family separation crisis, it allowed us an opportunity to think in a very big way about how we looked at criminal justice reform in the city of Atlanta. So we had already begun the process of reimagining this 450,000 square foot city detention center. And we looked at, can this be a place for affordable um, housing with supportive services, 24-hour daycare, a place that people can go and get their GED, receive vocational training? That work was already underway when we 
uh, got into this summer and all of the very big and public conversations on social justice. Um, this summer, President Obama issued a challenge to mayors across the country to proactively take a look at our use of force policies. We accepted the challenge, created an advisory committee to do that, and not 48 hours later, we had a deadly shooting involving one of our police officers that was uh, televised nationally. So it very quickly was our reminder in the city of Atlanta that no matter how much work we're doing, how well-intentioned we are, how much time we think we have to get it done, uh, this is work that just simply can't wait, wait. And Dr. King referred to it as a fierce urgency of now. So we are continuing with the work that was happening, but also accelerating what we're doing with our policies as it relates to criminal justice reform, as we look at our uh, policies related to our police department. We have accepted the eight can't wait uh, policy recommendations. We've already done that. But what was very clear as we experienced a shooting in our city this summer is that in so many ways, there has to be a mind reset with our public safety partners and also with our communities on how we work together and what the responsibilities and roles are um, as it relates to making sure that our communities are safe. So racism is something that, that has, has obviously been a part of America since the inception of America. It, it has taken on a very different form this year uh, through all of the protests that we've seen across the country and the responses to what we've seen happen, particularly uh, with encounters with police officers. But that being said, there is, is um, a very active agenda in Atlanta and one that will continue and one that has to even continue at a faster speed, given all that we've seen happening across the country over the past few months. Thank you, Mayor Bob. There's a lot to work on there, of course, as you suggest. And I like that phrase when you said mind reset. Um, I think that can be applied to a lot of the issues that we're talking about today, no doubt. Uh, I want to urge everyone to maybe jump in if something strikes your fancy to respond to. We'll go around a little bit one by one, but please, um, other participants, feel free to pipe up. Um, and I'd like to go over to Mayor Cabaldin right now and, and ask you, about your city and systemic racism, and, and what are the issues that you're facing in, in West Sacramento? Maybe people on the call a little bit less familiar with your metropolis. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks, Andy, and thanks to Verizon for hosting and the New York Conference of Mayors for the, uh, for the continuing opportunity to learn from one another. And yeah, I'm out here on the West Coast uh, in California in a relatively small city um, uh, where our challenges around the history of racism are not as apparent. Uh, but they're just as real. And we're still grappling with issues of the legacy of exclusionary zoning, of redlining. Uh, we still have housing covenants that you sign when you buy a house in our, in, even in my own city, where you, you have to agree to uh, sale restrictions that no longer have the force of law, but they're still in all of our, in, in all of our rules. So this is, even out here on the West Coast, even in California, we're, we're grappling with this issue in a really serious uh, way. And that's true across the country, whether it's Tampa or, uh, College Park, Maryland, or Scranton, Pennsylvania, or Rochester Hills, Michigan. Uh, cities of all sizes are, are coming to the fight and coming to the battle now. I think what we also recognize, though, is that talk is cheap, right? We, for many of us, uh, for many mayors, we're, we're grappling with a legacy of 5, 10, 20 years of people saying, hey, let's make sure that the word equity appears on page 27 of the general plan, or that our zoning code mentions diversity. That's not enough, and it's not delivering uh, the real kind of systemic change that we're talking about. We're talking, and we're also not talking about just programs to ameliorate disparities, right? I, as a mayor, I'm pretty good at that. Like, I, I wanna, I'm gonna announce, announce a new initiative on Tuesday that's gonna deal with the fact that, 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 that uh, we don't have enough preschool opportunities in our community, and preschool will turn things around. Well, you know what? Preschool will turn things around if you also change who gets into college, if you also change uh, what, what, what jobs get paid a living wage, but you've gotta deal with the systemic issues, and I think that's what we are, we're finally grappling with, and even in communities like ours. So after, as, as Mayor Bottom said, uh, after the uh, after the June protests in particular, uh, and the focus on our own community, and uh, the, we answered the president President Obama's challenge as well, convened a group of 
of community leaders. And they said, hey, look, Mayor, uh, we're, we're less worried about uh, police violence in our city as we are about, you know, as an African-American uh, family living on a, on a cul-de-sac in West Sacramento, my neighbors call the police on me every other week. And, 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 and Mayor, imagine what it's like to have uh, armed officers come into your 12 year old birthday party because the noise is too loud and the sense of ongoing unsafety and harassment that's occurring even in the quiet suburbs of communities like mine. So within 60 days, we reorganized our police department uh, to create a new division uh, that's focused on responding to calls that don't require an armed officer with folks that can serve the community uh, and that can deal with mental health issues. Uh, and can deal with other issues in ways that don't that don't over respond and create the kind of conditions and escalation that is both unnecessary, but that has also been used as a tool of racism in communities all across the country. I guess the other thing that we've really focused on here is to try to grapple with you know the the, the fundamentals, the systemic nature of this, which is wealth creation, entrepreneurship, access to educational and economic opportunities. Um, and so we've uh, we did do preschool, actually, universal preschool in our community, then a guaranteed paid internship for every high school student, guaranteed uh, scholarship to college. This year, we became the first in the country to uh, um, automatically admit every high school student that's graduated from our local high schools directly into college. This is an initiative I announced actually at the National Urban League uh, two years ago. But we, we, we became the first in the country to do this. So it's not just about a single program here and there. It's about linking together a systemic response to the systemic racism that's on the ground. We're really lucky as mayors right now, there's so many tools out there, um, you know, the uh, mapping tools to, to like look at how does redlining and exclusionary zoning, how's that playing out today in tax structures? How's that playing out today and who has sidewalks and who has parks? We have the tools, we have, and now our communities are ready to step up, just finally grapple with the, with the, with the, with the legacy that our communities uh, have, have dealt with. Because it's where cities where racism has been the most encoded like literally in our zoning codes more than any other place. And as mayors, we grapple with systemic racism, not as a concept, but for real people in real neighborhoods. Uh, and so this is where this is where the battle has to be met. And I'm proud that so many mayors are doing it around the, around the country. Thank you, Mayor Cabaldin. And I like the uh, technology facets that you talked about there. That's really fascinating and, and interesting. And, and also the distinction you make between performative talk and actually action, um, very important stuff there. And you mentioned education a few times, and so I think it's a good time to bring in President Campbell, Mary Schmidt Campbell, the president of Spelman, and um, ask you about addressing systemic racism at your institution. Um, obviously something that's top of mind always, but this year I think in particular. Uh, thank you, Andy. It's it's great to be here, and I want to shout out to uh, our mayor, Keisha Lance Bottoms, for the courageous way she has been leading the city during this uh, COVID crisis. So, thank you, Mayor Bottom, Bottoms. But I think the single most important thing that we can do as a country is educate our children and educate them well, and we're not doing that now. And we're especially not doing that now for children in the black community and the Latinx community, uh, whether it's preschool, K through 12, or college completion. And so we have, we have an opportunity, it seems to me, moving forward to really rally all of our resources in order to make sure that we are delivering A plus gold standard education. And we don't have to think of them as being separate. So, for example, at Spelman College, we have our college students who are going out into the public schools in our neighborhood and teaching literacy. They've been highly trained to do that. They've been doing it now for two years, and the results have been spectacular. We're beginning to, we're going to start a program in the summer where we begin to train our college students to go out into the public schools and work with middle schools and high schools to bring up math proficiency. So it's the idea is that we have a responsibility not only to get our students to the finish line, but we have a responsibility to reach back into this K through 12 uh, population and bring them forward. So imagine what we could do if this became unified. If urban communities, many of which have many colleges, uh, uh, large and small, private, public, 
if we mobilized ourselves, we could have a massive change in the in the the success rates of our students in just these fundamentals. But there are other areas that I think that are that that are opportunities now. And I was listening to Hans describe all of the wonderful things that Verizon are doing. And we're beginning to forge uh, extraordinary partnerships with the corporations and businesses that are in our community, because they understand that it's not just about coming and selecting our best students, it's coming into our colleges and universities and preparing our students to enter into the workforce, to offering them internships, to giving them a pathway from college into the the, the work world. And in Atlanta, we have four historically black colleges and universities that make up the Atlanta University Center. And almost all uh, urban centers have clusters of historically black colleges and universities. So, so there's a great deal that we can do if we begin to think about how we connect and amplify each other's efforts. Thank you, President Campbell. And so we're going to move from Atlanta to Augusta. I'm realizing we have 50% Georgians on this call. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Oh, Tom also? Oh, my goodness. Oh, we're outnumbered here, Mark. We're outnumbered, man. Uh, we're outnumbered. Okay. It's a sunny outnumbered day. For sure. You're outnumbered. It's a sunny day in Georgia. <laughs> Mayor Davis, let me go over to you and ask you um, about about COVID-19 and healthcare and the healthcare system. And you know, what are the the ties between COVID and the healthcare system and systemic racism? I mean, obviously, it's highlighted um, inequity um, in our communities and the disproportionate impact that it's had on people of color is is shocking. Thanks, Andy, for that. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Yeah. I'd like to uh, package all of what Mayor Bottoms has said and Mayor Cabaldon have said as it relates to this. When we think about the impact of COVID and beyond the threat that COVID has posed to lives, we see the threat. Uh, when we take the information that we've received from trusted public health advisors, uh, experts that we know uh, understand the science and the data, which we believe all of us should be following. Uh, you look at COVID's impact to black and brown communities, and in particular, you have to attach that to uh, the challenges around systemic racism, which quite frankly is a complex system of beliefs and behaviors that have been grounded for generations. Uh, when you look at that and see the approach that has happened across this country, uh, at the local level in terms of every one of us saying that we're going to solve the challenge of the health, welfare, and safety of our own citizens, independent of what the federal government does, and in some instances, our own states have or have not done. Uh, we've taken an approach here in Augusta, and I know my fellow mayors on this call have done as well. We get access to equitable health care options and opportunity to the citizens directly. Redlining has played a role in that uh, in terms of where people have not had access for generations. To I mean, when you think about how we've tried to attack COVID, it all began with mobile testing sites. Well, when you look at communities of color, the majority of those folks who desperately needed that type of access, they didn't have personally owned vehicles. They didn't have immediate access to the mobile drive up sites because they're just suburbia. And so in our case, what we've done in terms of really trying to attack this and address race-based disparities in our healthcare system is taking the services directly to them. In most of our communities, there are fire stations, fire stations that people can walk up to, fire stations where they have uh, people that they trust, public responders, uh, first responders in the immediate community. And so that was one of the ways that we in Augusta have looked holistically at how do we immediately begin attacking this issue? When you look at the broader issues of health care or the lack of it in our system across this nation, that's why it's so important for us to have things like Obamacare, i.e. the Affordable Care Act, where people who disproportionately, at one point in time in the state of Georgia, we had 1.2 million people who were either uninsured or underinsured 
across this nation, some 47, almost 48 million people who did not have adequate access to appropriate. And COVID has exacerbated that. Uh, you've got the challenges of where disproportionately the comorbidities are in black and brown communities. And so when you don't have that immediate access to care, and then there's that fear of what will happen to me once I'm getting that level of care. And so to that end, we've tried to tackle that as mayors because we are trusted voices. We are on the front lines. Uh, we're the ones closest to the people. And once again, in Augusta in general, we've taken every option and made it available. We've taken our fire trucks, gone into neighborhoods and stood up post where we were with testing. I think that's really when government truly begins to meet the needs of its citizens in a way, but in a very direct way. And so as we continue to focus around dismantling systemic racism, we have to then look back at when we talked about opening states and governments and communities up, the broader challenge was around, again, the threat to lives from COVID, but also the threat to livelihoods and the first few back into the arena of working were once again disproportionately members of black and brown communities whether they were frontline industrial workers retail sales public transit trucking warehousing jobs and without question the restaurant industry and these are individuals families friends neighbors loved ones who needed child care they needed access to social services and we've tried to put together wraparound services to begin addressing that it's important for us to have the support of the private sector to really be able to do that in a substantial way. Thank you, Mayor Davis. And we're going to go to our representative of the private sector right now, Hans. And before I, I ask you about technology and the role it can play, and a number of the mayors touched on that, Hans, I just want to um, let people on this call know that they might not how much um, this issue has mattered to you. Uh, I know that you spoke to all of us at Verizon passionately and even emotionally about this uh, months and months ago and have been relentless in terms of pushing us to not only talk about it, but actually take action. So thank you, Hans, for that, really. Um, so um, Mayor Kalbadon talked about um, using tracking. There's the digital divide. There are so many places that a company like Verizon can play here. And, and I'm just wondering, how do you actually choose how you deploy your resources and your bandwidth in terms of addressing these various issues, Hans? I think I agree with all the mayors speaking about where we are, these special circumstances also seeing some silver lining uh, for making everything available uh, to anyone, wherever you're born or where, wherever you come from. And that's the digital inclusion. But we also see a risk that we can have even have a bigger separation right now. And, I, and, and how I address it and how I, we at Verizon address it, we need to first of understand, do we have our community have accessibility to broadband? And then can they afford it? And lastly, is the devices, content for education, for healthcare, etc. That's the triage we need to have. And that's why the combination of mayors and private companies together, because it's a gray zones in between who is doing what here. But we all need to understand that this is one of the ways to bridge the, the gap and, and uh, uh, making a, a society more equitable. I worked with the Sustainable Development Goals uh, since 2015 and even the Millennium Development Goals across the globe. I've been always talking about the 21st century's infrastructure is mobility, broadband and cloud. And we as a corporation, we need to be part of making that social decision, but we also need that cooperation from the from the cities. And many of the mayors that is on this call and in this panel are working with us and other technology companies to making that happen right now. So we have more to do, uh, uh, much more to do in this area. But when I see my colleagues in the private sector also feeling equally much about this topic, I think we're moving in the right direction. We can always do faster and more, but definitely the momentum is going the right way to work with digital inclusion in this country and also in the rest of the world, because this is a worldwide challenge that we're, uh, we, are, uh, we are challenged with right now. Thank you very much, Hans. add something. 
please. Andy, if I may add something to that. Hans, thank you so much for uh, what Verizon is doing across the country and certainly in communities like ours. What I would offer is that as we look for collaborative uh, mayors are always on the front lines. We're the ones closest yeah. to the challenge and experiencing in our communities. What I would in, what I would urge is bring us to the table as you're having your board meetings. I know you've got tremendous resources to be able to deploy, uh, but when we look at how do we uh, be first to market, I know that's a term that we use in the private sector, be first to market. Well, because we're the ones leading uh, in our local communities, I would urge that you engage mayors at an even more tangible level so that they deploy those resources in communities that we are a part of those high level discussions. I think that can be more tangible uh, wins uh, as Verizons of the world begin to expand into communities of interest, particularly those that are underserved. Yeah. About Augusta, we're the cybersecurity capital of the nation. And yet, I don't. 500 homes, not all in the inner city, but some that are just a mile and a half away from the military installation where all of this incredible work to our nation's infrastructure, our nation is, and yet they have no access. Um, COVID has further exacerbated that. Uh, I've got students who are in hybrid situations, and I'm sure the rest of the mayors are as well, but you've got the technology experts to know how to deploy rapidly get those solutions to us and we're here poised and ready to link our arms and say, let's make it happen and make people's lives better bear bottoms let me thank ask you me about that. sorry Hans. No, bottoms, just thank you, you for the for, for the comment yep yeah. i want to follow up with mayor bottoms about that i'm going to ask you about some of the private sector uh connections that you might have in your city i mean you've got coca-cola and delta right there have you been able to partner with companies like that in terms of these issues? We certainly have, and Verizon's been a great partner with the city of Atlanta, although they are um, don't have their headquarters here yet. Uh, there are a lot of other Fortune 500 companies that have chosen to call Atlanta home, uh, 26 in fact, and President Campbell is a part of a group that we have called ACP, the Atlanta for, Committee for Progress. And it was especially important to help us with so many initiatives. Uh, we call it combining compassion with commerce in the city of Atlanta. But even as we embarked upon having to make decisions on how we would respond to the pandemic and whether or not we would shut the city down um, back in March, I was in one of these meetings um, when we received our first presentation from Dr. Carlos Del Rio at Emory University on just the gravity of what we were facing with COVID and uh, the fact that we had just a matter of days to make decisions about closing down our city. And it was important that I had um, President Campbell and these Fortune 500 CEOs at the table with me to receive that information because we were able to make a decision uh, that really impacted our entire city and I think saved us from the worst of what could have happened as we looked at the numbers skyrocketing across the, re the rest of the state. So even with decisions from something as big as how we shut down our city and our job centers, to how do we stand up our Center for Workforce Innovation, uh, that's led by our CEOs in our city. We just launched a tech training program where I had Ed Bastian from Delta Airlines saying I have 10,000 mechanics jobs in the city and I'm having to go out of state to hire people. Uh, Craig Manier from the Home Depot saying we need more plumbers and electricians and the, the list goes on. We were able to take what the CEOs were giving us as real life needs and then stand up an education program. And it really, I, I count ourselves very fortunate in Atlanta because what I've recognized is so many other mayors don't have access to those resources. Um, and, and as Mayor Davis even talked about what we're facing with the digital divide in our communities, we have just stood up some small learning pods in the city of Atlanta and in bringing kids literally off of the playgrounds from our recreation centers, we quickly learned that there were kids who have been on the playground every day since March. They haven't been in school. 
getting them into the learning pods and then connecting with our companies who are sending us certified tutors, et cetera, to make sure that our kids get the support that they need has been a godsend. So I, I don't take that support for granted. And I know it's something that continues to make Atlanta the special place that it is. And, you know, Hans, if you want to talk about corporate relocations, I'll, I'll be available after this call too. <laughs> and thank you, Mayor Bob, for um, and, mentioning, and go I ahead. Make, um, yeah. Yeah, let, let me let me just talk, give you a little a bit about my relationship with the private sector. It was uh, August 11th in 2017 in Charlottesville, Virginia, where we had the Unite uh, the Right rally, where we had uh, neo-Nazis and white supremacists that came into that city, and of course it resulted in the death of a one. A wonderful person there. Within uh, 24 hours, Walmart called me and said, "We have to do something about this." I put out a I put out a statement to the nation's mayors, and we formed a compact against hate. I put that thing out on Wednesday. By Friday at 11 o'clock. 373 mayors had signed on to this. And so we formed with Brian Stevenson down in Montgomery, uh, Steve Benjamin and Mayor Fisher and others went down there, and we formed a compassionate center at the United States Conference of Mayors. And Walmart, Comcast, and dear old Coca-Cola in Atlanta helped us do that. And so from there, from that day forward, we continue to celebrate what the, what the mayors are doing with the business community to fight racism. So you know, you know, governors walk around with with their you know with their people around them. State legislatures, God Almighty, what they do. Mayors are called. Yeah. Mayors live with the diversity of this nation in their neighborhoods and their cities. And so, I just want to just tell you that. Whatever we have done positively, we have always had the good business community of America with us. And that's the spirit of this webinar. We've got to continue to bring the mayors and the business community together. And, and I appreciate this, this, uh, this effort. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to go over to Mark. Mary, I know you want, you want to make a quick comment, Mary? Please, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, on the point of technology and education, one thing the yeah. state legislature in Georgia did do well is that they mandated wow. that every student should have education in computer science. And so the, the idea that you have a, a student body that's not only literate in terms of reading and math proficiency, but is fluent in technology has got to be uh, an absolute requirement for us, the K through 12 and through uh, four years of college education. Absolutely. Um, Mark, do you mind if I mention your new book? Go ahead, please. <laughs> He's got, he has a new book, the, the Gumbo Coalition, which is terrific, and, and it's about leadership, um, which is great. And so I'm wondering what you would think or how you would assess the leadership of President Trump when it comes to uh, America's cities. Uh, you know, the, the president from his comments early on about Baltimore, acts as though he's not responsible for what goes on in American cities. He points the fingers at cities as though they're not part of the United States. And part of the response is, well, Mr. President, where's your urban policy? Where's your HUD secretary? Where is your, uh, your, your, your administration's focus other than uh, a talking point here about an opportunity zone or a small gesture over there. Uh, if you read my book, I've got a uh, chapter in there about not being paralyzed by the unexpected. And what President Trump's leadership in COVID reflects is paralysis by the unexpected. COVID was unexpected. He couldn't adjust and pivot. 
he bounced around by denying it and calling it a hoax, acting as though it's something that happened to him, denying the science. It was a textbook example of how not to lead in a crisis. It was a textbook example of how not to respond when faced with the unexpected. Mayors deal with crises each and every day and have to pivot and adjust, keep their cool, keep their calm, uh, pull people together, sometimes work with people that are not their best political allies, sometimes push back on some of your political allies because of what's best and what's right for the city. And I think the president, uh, it, it's just been, it's really been a stunning sort of example to me of, of quite candidly a failure in leadership uh, uh, from, from planning to communicating to adjusting and responding in a crisis. And, and, and that's been, I'm stunned by it because any one of the mayors, uh, uh, university presidents, any one of you who've been uh, know uh, that some of the basic fundamentals do not seem to have been met. The basic idea that when you're in a position of trust and leadership, you, you, you surround yourself with experts, with knowledgeable people, and you listen to them. Now you push back on them, you might disagree with them, you might sharpen them, you might challenge them, but fundamentally you don't toss what they say out of the window uh, before you even heard it because somehow it doesn't fit the narrative you're seeking to create. It's a lesson to be learned. Uh, and, and my book talks about a number of things uh, we dealt with, and I'll say this to the mayors, Tom and I were planning right before 9-11 a major tour of America. It was gonna be called the Competitive Cities Tour. We were in Washington, D.C. at the Willard Hotel talking to David Broder the columnist for the New Washington Post is going to write a big story. We're going to the his Kodak Theater in LA his birthday. and announce yeah. this big. And the, the idea was to talk about the successes that had happened in cities in the late 1990s. As we were talking to David Broder, Rhonda Spears Bell, who still works for me, who worked for me at that time, a Georgian, I might add, walked in and said that two planes had hit the World Trade Center. And we looked up and we said, must be a Piper aircraft that got mislaid. We didn't fathom. Five minutes later, she walked in and said there was a terrorist attack. We had to completely take the idea of the competitive cities tour, toss it right out of the window. Tom and I were whisked to the emergency operations center uh, at uh, in Washington, D.C., Mayor Anthony Williams. We sat there for 12 hours. And while we were there for 12 hours, we said we have to do something. We came up with the idea of the TSA of federalizing airport security, because before that it was handled by cities who basically hired private security guard firms. Didn't work, wasn't workable, needed another response. We came up with the idea of a Homeland Security Initiative with grants to cities, because at the time we thought Atlanta was gonna be attacked and Chicago was gonna be attacked and New Orleans was gonna be attacked. Uh, and we, we pivoted immediately on the spot and 30 days later, we had a summit in Washington, D.C. We brought the mayors, the police chiefs, and the fire chiefs together to or construct a plan for the security of American cities and the economic rebound of American cities because we had uh, uh, the, the travel uh, ban that occurred after 9 /11. The point is, is that when you're a president or you're a mayor or you're a governor, you're going to be hit with the unexpected. And what you can't do is fall to pieces. And, 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 and just engage in verbal attacks. You've got to respond intelligently. You've got to respond uh, in, 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 in a directed way. And so I think the president, you know, for all of the bluster in this crisis, it was stunning to me how maybe he didn't see that a effective response to this crisis would have strengthened his leadership position. Look at George W. Bush. George W. Bush did not have a majority of the popular vote. Uh, and his response to 9-11 strengthened his political standing. And that lasted for a number of years. Now he made, in my opinion, a bad decision on the Iraq war, uh, but the initial response strengthened his standing because he was responsive to uh, uh, the, the, the crisis and pivoted. 
this president for some reason never pivoted even to this minute to understand we want you to lead us and we want you to lead us out of this lead us beyond these troubled wars can I, can, I, can I jump in just for a second? Because I think that, you know, we're, we're, we're talking, systemic racism isn't just like a whole lot of racism. It's not random acts of racism. What I think is, it, what is both unique and imperative about the work that we're undertaking right now is that it is, we, we have to get to the root causes. We've got to, we got to solve these, some of these issues. And that doesn't mean, we're mayors. We don't, we don't, I don't announce a end systemic racism act um, at my city council and it gets adopted in February and then we, we, we you know, we, we do a signing ceremony. It's a you know we got to trudge through every single one of those issues, whether that's redlining or or policing or access to capital, all of those at, at at once. But this is our moment to really do something at the systemic level, and I think that's what that's what's what's uh, what's key here. Uh, and we are grappling with a with a system, at, and Mark's talked about this at the at the national level, where it's not just that they're getting it wrong; it's that we are we are swimming upstream against a current of systemic racism. That is that is playing itself out in our community. So I just want to emphasize that part. A lot of what we're trying to grapple with now is not just one more program. It's not just one more economic development initiative. Although that's how we do our business day to day. But I think mayors are across the country are weaving these initiatives together, weaving these policies together to make a real deep difference with partners like Verizon and others. And it's the only thing that we can do. It's not. It just will not be enough for us to simply say, you know, preschool for all done. Right, that's not that will not do it all by itself unless we're also providing job efforts opportunities grappling with discrimination access to capital and everything else at the same time this is the moment then that's finally happening and mayors are trying to lead the way mayor cabal then i think that's uh, spot on and a terrific way to end this conversation and uh, you mentioned hans vesberg and so i am going to turn it over to you hans for closing remarks thank you all so much Thank you. I will not make a summary of this rich discussion on dismantling racism. I, I will just say that I, I, I truly enjoy to listen to the conversation and what we can do to get them more. And, and I'm not only representing Verizon. I, I, I think we're representing the private sector and how we need to interact between uh, all the cities and, and with the mayors going forward. I just want to mention one thing. I think Mark uh, brought it up that uh, the, I'm also in the BRT and I'm a part of the subcommittee for uh, equitable justice. And uh, Mark is right. We will also act from that position and we will in the next couple of weeks have quite a lot uh, coming out from that group. And I'm, I've had a lot of discussions there as well and getting inputs from what we can do more as a private sector. And that's more than 200 of the largest corporations of the, the country. So not saying that we're perfect or doing everything we should, but at least we are progressing and we're progressing because we're listening and we're taking actions. As uh, Mayor Cabaldon said, this is time of actions and I, I will not... Uh, uh, summarize more. I would like to thank the panelists. I would thank all the mayors on this call. And uh, next week we have a, our next webinar together with our co uh, co host. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. And once again, thank you very much for being here, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks, everybody.